Welcome to the Smart Connector, a podcast for entrepreneurs who put people first. If you haven't done so already, hit that subscribe button to make sure you never miss an episode. In our podcast, we'll be looking at the power of authentic connection and how it can build your business success. We feature interviews with leading entrepreneurs and offer strategies to bring power to all your relationships, including the one you have with yourself. Be a smart connector to the architect of your amazing business and life. Generating rapport with others is one of the most essential skills we can have in business and life. Isn't it sad, therefore, that we receive so little education and training on the skills that support it when they can make such a difference to our personal effectiveness as well as our success? Without rapport, no one will be interested in the message we're trying to communicate or the service we want to provide. If we lose rapport, we also lose the chance to influence or to persuade others. If we want to influence others, we need also to be willing to be influenced, which means taking on someone else's perspective and wishes. Whether we're an entrepreneur, a marketer, salesperson, professional or parent, or working in any other role or sector, knowing how to develop rapport will improve our success with others as well as our performance. I've got 10 easy ways for you to build rapport with others. The first way is to listen actively. When we're forming a new relationship, we often talk a lot, but the best way to build rapport is to focus deeply and with your full attention on what the other person is saying. Listening in this way builds trust and makes the other party more receptive to our message. The best way to listen actively is to embrace the 80-20 rule. Try to talk 20% of the time and listen 80%. Stay with the topic the other person's introduced and ask ever-deepening questions based on their response. So here's an example. We're going to call one speaker A for Anna and the next one B for Barney. So Barney's the one who's practicing his active listening skills on Anna. A. I haven't been here for ages. It's good to be back. B. When was the last time you were here? A. It was for my friend Janine's birthday. We had such a great time. B, with enthusiasm, sounds amazing. What was it that made it so good for you? A, Janine and our other friends hadn't met up for ages as a crowd and I've forgotten how much fun we had together. I really love having fun with our friends. B, that must have been brilliant. Why is it so much fun when you're together? A, well, we often seem to end up teasing each other and falling about laughing. B, oh, I love it when that happens. There's nothing like having a laugh to make you feel great about life. What sort of things do you like to tease each other about? After this, the subject could change as any more than three to four active listening style questions focused on the same subject can begin to feel probing and even a bit repetitive. It's a bit like a dance where one person's allowed to lead until the leading becomes boring and predictable. Then the other party needs to bring some interest and originality to the table. As you can see in the example, Barney is offering offering Anna focus, interest and attention, which is why Anna will be feeling relaxed and increasingly engaged. Rapport is being built. Active listener Barney is also emphasising similarities in the statement, I love it when that happens and we always like people, we feel alike us. The second way is to offer sincere compliments. I love the way you do that. What a great jacket. Where on earth did you get it? You have such a clever way of explaining things. You're so brilliant at that stuff. We love people who pay us compliments, but they must be sincere. Too often we think nice things about other people and we don't say them for fear of making ourselves look silly. Or sometimes we think we're going to look a bit smarmy or creepy. It doesn't matter. We shouldn't give compliments to get compliments or we shouldn't worry about being silly either. So give compliments instead of thinking them. You're providing such a gift to another person and they'll be very appreciative. The benefit will come back to you in terms of the rapport that's been built. And if you're the recipient of a sincere compliment, always accept it gracefully as a gesture from someone who wants to build rapport with you. 
The third way is to talk in terms of what's important to the other person. As mentioned earlier, when we stay entrenched in our own values or story, we'll struggle to generate rapport with others. It can be very helpful, therefore, to put time and effort in trying to understand another person's values, wishes and perspective. We should think about what they might like the outcome of their relationship or encounter with us to be, and bear these things in mind when we're talking to them. Understanding another's needs and desires creates rapport between people and helps us make the shift from judgment to compassion. Here's a simple example. Let's say you're meeting someone to discuss whether you want to work as a joint venture or business partner with them. Take time beforehand to research their history, preferences, connections and any social media or personal activity that gives you clues to their character and interests. When you meet with them, refer to these and ask questions related to them. They'll be surprised and flattered that you've taken the time to do this. This means you can start your relationship from a place of warmth, both personally and professionally. You'll have an idea of the other person's values by the research you've done. For example, if you research me, you might understand that I place an extremely high value on authentic connection and win-win relationships. So one of the first questions I might ask myself about a prospective partner is how that person is going to relate to my values. Do they care about me as a person and will they take time and effort to build the relationship? Or is it simply business all the way? If it's just business and they're going to be shut off to me personally, I might decline the invitation to collaborate as it really matters to me to enjoy the people I'm working with rather than just make money with them. Although that's good too. The fourth way is to match and mirror body language and energy levels. When we're with people we care about, we match and mirror naturally. Acquiring the skills to do this with people we don't necessarily feel as close to increases our capacity to create rapport with them. When we match and mirror, we don't just listen with our ears, we listen with our whole selves, every sense and multiple intelligences. We're fully attentive to and present to the other person. We match and mirror by observing the other person's gestures and reflecting them without copying obviously. Are they leaning towards us or away from us? Are they using sweeping hand gestures or looking around the room? Observe how they're standing, sitting or moving and then adopt similar postures and gestures. But be careful, you have to do it subtly or they'll pick up on what you're doing and lose trust. This may sound manipulative, but the intention is what makes the difference. If you intend to manipulate, sure, matching and mirroring can be manipulative. If you intend to generate rapport with sincere intentions, you can use matching and mirroring to do this too. Of course, I'd only recommend the version that demonstrates your integrity and character. We should always use plenty of eye contact and touch if we're trying to build rapport fast, but don't overdo it if the other person is a little bit reticent, as you might scare them away. So be conscious of others' behaviour and comfort levels in this respect, and remember to mirror and match with this too. What's the energy level of the other person? Are they quiet and reserved or lively and extroverted? If they're naturally low-key, it might be perceived as confrontational if you come across as too loud and lively. This will decrease rapport. Matching someone's energy levels is only manipulative if the intention behind it is. Really, I think you're just being sophisticated and paying someone a compliment if you let them lead the way. The fifth way is to adopt a similar tone of voice. We need to match and mirror tone and rhythm of voice too. How is the other person speaking, fast or slow, brief and to the point or rambling and waffly, loud or quiet, full of swear words or, dis or discreetly polite? Here's an example using Anna and Barney again. Anna says, hey Barney, where have you been this last month? I've missed you so much. And Barney says, where have you been, Anna? It's amazing to see you. Can't believe how the time's flown. Contrast this with Anna. Oh, hi Barney, good to see you again. What have you been up to recently? Barney. Oh, hi Anna, I've been working pretty hard, so it's great to have some downtime to relax this evening. I'm glad I bumped into you. You can see the difference. The sixth way is to make empathic statements. Empathic statements keep the focus of the conversation on others. There's a simple formula for this, which is, so you. This keeps the focus on the other person and lets them know you're paying attention to them. For example, 
so you feel things have gone well for you this week or so you think it's been hard to get things going in the way you'd like and so on. The so you formula ensures that the focus of the conversation remains on the other person. Here's an example again, Anna. So Barney, do you feel you got what you needed from the meeting today? Barney, well, it was useful to hear about the plans for the skate park, but I wasn't sure how that would go down with the committee. Anna, so what is it you felt unsure about, Barney? Barney, well, historically they've turned down similar proposals. I wonder whether we ought to submit an alternative. Anna, so what alternative do you think might work for them, Barney? In this example, you can see that Anna has used the words so and you three times to extract deeper levels of insight from Barney. You can also use what's called the empathic presumptive. So the empathic presumptive is when we are either moving towards a sale or directing the outcome of a conversation. It draws additional information from the other person by presenting a fact, but leaves the interpretation of the fact to the other person. If the presumptive fact is true, the third party will add new information to the conversation or correct the presumptive. So for example, you could say, so you're looking to go on holiday next month? And the other person could say, no, I'm going to wait until May because the weather's much better that, at that time. Or, yeah, I love to avoid the crowds and that's the perfect time of year to do it. At this point, we're presented with the opportunity to explore the conversation in more depth because we can ask, so does better weather mean warmer or cooler for you? Or, so what is it you don't like about crowds? This is when we move empathic statements into active listening and begin the rapport building process. Remember the word so and use it, clarifying and extending the, the discussion. Let's do another practice run. Anna, so shall I book the, the tickets for the concert, Barney? Barney, not yet, I'm not sure I can make that evening. Anna, so what else is going on, Barney, and could it be changed? I know you'd love to see the feeling and tickets are selling out. Barney, well, it's my brother's birthday, so I need to call him and find out what he's got planned. Maybe I'll ask him if he'd like to come too. You can see the empathic presumptive is more directive. It puts the, the other person under a little bit of pressure, but often in sales, this is what's needed to prompt the other person to take action now, rather than delaying the decision and making you chase them. Empathic statements create a win-win. The other person feels you're remaining focused and attentive to their needs. And ultimately, this is what rapport is all about, stepping outside your own needs and stepping into someone else's. The seventh way to build rapport is to move into their world. Disagreeing with someone puts you in an oppositional position and destroys rapport. So to build rapport in a challenging or high stakes situation, it's important to put negative emotions to one side and bring in curiosity instead. Why is someone behaving in a certain way? What's their motivation? What are they hoping to achieve? How can you appreciate their perspective, even if it's different to yours? Find some identification and common ground as humans. If emotions run high, the stakes are high, and you have a difference of opinion with someone, it's always best to take some time out and a bit of a breather to consider their perspective before you go back in with your more constructive problem-solving head-on. I've read a whole book about this called Crucial Conversations and it's certainly quite fascinating. It actually contains a method and a system for resolving high intensity disagreements, which is something I've incorporated into my own life and work. So the eighth way to generate rapport is to ask someone to do something small for you or help you with advice. The key to this is not to put people on the defensive by asking for too much too soon. If you meet someone wealthy for the first time and you ask them to lend you $100,000 or pounds, this would scare them away and they'd think you rude and presumptuous. But asking someone for advice, for example, I'd love to hear how you got started in X or tell me how you managed to do Y, both flatters someone's ego and makes them feel you're interested in them. Asking someone for something small that doesn't inconvenience them. For example, can I ask you to keep my phone while I visit the restroom? Or I'm not sure what to eat. Do you have any recommendations? It's often given as standard dating advice. It shows a spirit of teamwork which people tend to lean into. It makes them think that you're not just a rampant egotist who does whatever you feel like without taking someone's, someone else's thoughts and feelings into consideration. 
It also sets an intention for a collaborative spirit to enter the picture. The reason why men apparently particularly like this is it makes them feel respected and a little bit proud of themselves. It ignites their protective instincts, so I'm told. The ninth way to generate rapport is to use someone's name. The sweetest sound to anyone is the sound of their own name. So use it liberally in conversation and across digital communications too. People will actually think you're paying attention to them as an individual and they'll respond better to you if you do this. The tenth way to generate rapport is to smile, laugh and joke. It goes without saying really that we love happy, cheerful people who smile a lot and make us laugh. So show up as a fun-loving person who can always make people laugh and you'll have the world at your feet. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast on generating rapport and found it useful. Thank you so much for listening or watching and I look forward to seeing you again on the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Smart Connector podcast. I invite you to follow me on social media or go to www.janebaylor.com to book a discovery call and learn about our exciting mentorships, masterminds and retreats. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.